Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. He's back in the bullpen today. We got Brad Palumbo, fee.org correspondent, National Review contributor, libertarian conservative journalist, and a very accomplished individual. Has been cited by many important people that I disagree with. Brad, welcome. Hey, happy new year. Happy new year, man. Glad to have you back on the program. We're going to chop it up about the labor shortage issues in America and also the shutdown of various colleges around the country. I don't want to presume what you know or believe about these topics. So if you would, give us your sentiment. Yeah, I think that we're seeing a big labor shortage that's causing a lot of problems. We have to ask ourselves why that is. We've got our unemployment rate back down to 4% almost, which is good. But you have to think about the millions of people that have dropped out of the labor force. And for me, I got two big takeaways that you're probably gonna disagree with. But one is that this shows that the economy doesn't work like a light switch. We did these shutdowns and these lockdowns back a year ago, and we're still having problems from them. You can't just shut things off and turn them back on. So it shows me that was a really disruptive mistake. And number two, I think it shows that between teachers unions fighting to keep schools closed in many places and a growing welfare state, we have a lot of government policies that are keeping people out of the labor force that I think are very problematic. Okay, so you got your thoughts and your feelings, I got facts. So let me read the facts to you. You can always check out my data from the Society for Human Resource Management nonpartisan organization. So they actually surveyed individuals who are people. They actually talk to actual people, not projections from some economist, not a political talking point from some elected official, not some Republican jargon or conservative counter argument. So according to the data, based on their research, the top reason why there's unemployment in America, 42% of respondents said it was because they have not received any responses for the jobs that they have applied for. Well, more and more people are applying for jobs that actually pay the bills. And if those jobs do not pay the bills, well, they engage in what's called the gig economy, Uber driving, etc. All right. So they're looking for jobs that pay the bills. 42% are saying those jobs, jobs aren't coming back to us. That's one. An additional primary reason for continued unemployment based on the survey results. 32% of individuals said it was because of fear of being exposed to COVID. And this is rooted in the cross tabs of the data in employers being schizophrenic as it relates to COVID protocol. That's two. The additional reason 29% of Americans polled said it was because they are being offered less pay, less pay to perform the job, okay? Um, Preparing for a career shift, meaning they want to do something else. So they're seeking education, training, certification, etc. 17%, brother. Out of everyone polled, my friend, only 11%. It's right here in the data, okay? These are actual people. 11% said it was because of expanded unemployment. Now, here's the problem with how you all contextualize this narrative. But are people gonna admit that? There's so much bias in polling, people not wanting to admit things that are socially undesirable. So I would rather believe people that actually took the time to be thoughtful about polling data. I believe in the American person. I believe in the American worker. I believe in the American job seeker. You believe in yourself. So your opinion somehow in your world trumps what people actually say it's happening on the streets. I believe the folks in the street. I believe the people that are saying, here's what's happening to me. Here's my experience. Here's my exposure. Here's my environment. And here's why. I believe them. You believe you. We can move on. Well, so there are um, a lot of those things, though, that you described are real issues. But for example, it doesn't make any sense to me why people would be saying, I'm not willing to go back into the workforce because I'm afraid of getting COVID. You and I both took the vaccine. We both agree the vaccine is very, very effective at keeping you safe from hospitalization and death from COVID. So take the vaccine and go back to work. That's not reasonable. And if you won't take the vaccine, well, we shouldn't have any time for you saying I won't go back to work because I'm scared because that's a choice you're making. So that's why I really don't see that piece of it is tied up 
in terms of benefits and the cushion that people got from getting trillions of government spending over the last year. You don't have the luxury to say I'm, I'm scared even though I'm vaccinated or I won't take the vaccine to go back to work unless you have a fallback option. And our, our welfare state does provide that, that fallback option for people. The other side of things is polls also consistently find that childcare is a big reason why people won't rejoin the labor force. I don't know if that specific poll you mentioned, but the Washington Post story that your producer sent me before the show even talked about this. Childcare is very important in terms of why people aren't rejoining the labor force. And that comes down to schools, in particular no, our it public schools. Correct. That's not what the data says. The data, and I did cover that because the 32% of continued unemployment in America is because of fear of being exposed to COVID-19. The 32% of respondents you disagree with, the reason, the primary reason for parents is because of exposure to their children and how it impacts their family structure. So it's not just because of them getting exposed to COVID, it's also due to them exposing their children and others to COVID. That is a reality in the data. Now, yes, other things, other variables are there. And you actually made another point I was going to make in the Build Back Better Act, which is supported by left leaning uh, politicians and not right leaning politicians. The Build Back Better Act actually addresses the issue of subsidies for child care in America. So, do you agree with the Build Back Better Act since you brought it up as a reason that individuals are not engaged in the job market as the economy should sustain? I do believe that child care is important, but okay. no, I don't support the Build Back Better agenda. So do you support that provision well, let me explain in the that. plan? The, the way the government subsidies tend to work mm. is that they end up inflating, inflating the prices and things get higher <laughs> over time. We've so seen wait that. a minute, wait a minute. Brother. Loan Come subsidies, on, that's a very basic economic, economic phenomenon okay. where Come when on, you man. subsidize something, prices go up and you get more of it. So wait it will only make the problem worse. What we need is teachers unions to stop fighting to close our schools like they just did in Chicago because schools are the biggest source of childcare for families. So we gotta stop that before anything else. And that won't cost taxpayers a dime. People just gotta start doing their jobs. You know, Brad, that's interesting. First of all, all public schools are taxpayer funded, number one. Out school programs, it varies. But all K through 12 regular education is taxpayer funded. It won't cost Brad. them an additional dime. To okay, go back to all right, so that, that's a jobs. context. I'm glad you added that. But Brad, think about what you're saying, brother. You have just agreed with me on this show that childcare is an element we must address in the United States of America because we are inside of a COVID climate, okay? We agree on that, we agree on that. Think about this with me and follow my linear logic. If we agree that the cost of childcare is hurting the overall economy or the workforce, then that means there should be some level of subsidy. Maybe we disagree on the methodology, but how do you get- how do you get the taxpayer dollar back to the taxpayer? Because the government, they don't make revenue. They're not creating money. They don't make profit. They're getting it from us. I agree, child care is an issue for many working Americans, especially those in the black community. That's a reality, brother. So now I need to get that money back to the communities that I love. And who holds the money? The federal government holds the money. So you tell me a better process to address the issue of not having disposable or extra income in order to pay for child care during COVID so that we can get this economy rolling as we think it should roll. Yes, yeah, subsidies are putting a Band-Aid on the injury. They're not actually addressing- So the what's the solution, costs. Brad? I will, I will explain. Okay. The biggest reason that childcare is so expensive in the United States is twofold. But one of those reasons is that it is so overregulated. I mean, there are places in America where you must have a bachelor's degree to work at a child as a childcare worker uh, in a nursery or or watching kids, and that's not that's people not, with no that, college that's degrees. Not true. That's not that true. Is this true. is my arena. But come on, man. My second doctorate is in education, brother. That's not true. You don't have to have a bachelor's degree to work in that field. There are some private companies that require it if you are going to be a school teacher inside of that arena because some child care agencies have certified teachers. It is definitely on the There are government uh, licensing list. schemes that require that. And I'm happy and, to and, look some and, up and, and send them to you. But think about this. You're talking about a position. We're talking about child care agencies. Child care agencies are able to exist without the prerequisite of a degree. You know that I know that. 
So don't throw that into the equation, Brad, as if in order to function as a child care agency in America, you must have some kind of degree to do so. That's not a prerequisite. In some places, there are regulations and licensing requirements that make well, you- Well, there are licensing groups. requirements for every single child care agency approved by the state government. And it should be because that means the protocols for child safety and child diet safety has been adhered to. But some of them are superfluous. Some of them go over <laughs> the top and make it very expensive to provide child care. Okay. And, and that's You still didn't answer my problem. question, Brad, Brad. How do I get the money back? We agree on the problem. How do I get the money back to the communities that need it, how? Stop taking it from them so much. Let them keep more of their paycheck, cut their taxes, then they can afford child care. All right, so let's talk about that because you bring up an interesting point. So you believe in lower taxation, correct? Absolutely. All right, good, I, I agree with you on that. So lower taxation means different things for different people. So let's say you have a disposable income per month of $22, right? Some people do, okay? Because they make such a low wage that all of their money goes to paying bills or necessities for living. And you're still going to tax that individual based on that system. That person deserves and requires a subsidy in the American workforce. Do you not agree? If they only have 20 plus dollars of disposable or additional income per month, they would require a subsidy to operate in your ideological world, right? Well, I believe in a hand up more than a hand out. I think okay. you could cut the sales tax that's eating away from their disposable income, cut the payroll tax that's eating on, that's away from their what if, brother, you, you realize you're talking about three or four governmental entities that would have to come together to cut the sales tax. You have a state sales tax, you have city sales tax, and for some places, the county even levies a sales tax. Now you're yeah. talking about getting four or five groups of political entities to implement all of this at one time. I'm trying, I'm being practical, Brad. I need to get the damn money that those communities have already given the government. I need to get that money back to those communities ASAP. I don't have time to wait one year, two years, three years or four for all of these political structures to get on the same page with taxation. That's a good ideological premise, brother. But it is not a good practical premise when you look at the implication. Well, practically speaking, right? we could ease the childcare problems tomorrow if schools were just kept open. Schools are the biggest provider of childcare in this country. And in places like Chicago, the teachers unions are literally striking right now to push them back into distance learning, which hurts working class and minority families especially hard because you know the rich the rich white people have nannies, right? But actual everyday Americans can't handle school shutdowns when teachers unions just are trying to shut down. I don't know why. Maybe they don't want to do their jobs. They've had the opportunity to hey be man, that's an unfair shot at school teachers. I was a Adopted by a school teacher, I won't let you do that. School teachers. Well, there's a big difference between teachers and okay? teachers unions. And teachers unions are not advocating for the best interests of children in places well, like many, Chicago. Many of the school teachers would disagree with you. I'm a former high school teacher myself. I would disagree with you on that sentiment. But that's a different debate, obviously. We still got to get to the school shutdowns. Because I agree we would debate that as well. School shutdowns in America happening across the board. You disagree with it, why? Well, for in particular for colleges, okay. a bunch of schools like Yale and Duke, they're going to remote. They're they're not having in-person learning the first few weeks of the semester, and I think it's terrible. I mean, last year we saw huge mental health problems among young people. The CDC has data that one in four people age um, 18 to 24 considered suicide. That's horrible. Major symptoms of depression and anxiety. There's no reason to put people through that isolation and shutting down the schools and the universities when the universities have very healthy populations, extremely young, then they have vaccine requirements, so everybody's vaccinated. So there's no reason these schools should be shutting down right now because of Omicron. There's no public health interest there, and there are real costs to people. They're stuck paying way too much for these degrees that they have to do at their mom's house at home on a laptop because of these alarmist over the top closures and policies. Yep, so I will say this, as a current college professor, we have a protocol. We have enacted that protocol where there's a delay in in-person learning until we can observe the science more thoroughly to make a long-term decision. I will say this, I find it interesting, Brad, that nobody complained about the flu. Would you agree 
that uh, many individuals will at least experience flu-like symptoms, if not worse, from any one of the COVID variants, right? You would agree to that? Yeah. Okay, I'm glad you agreed to that. Are you aware that colleges across America routinely close down when their flu infection rate is above 10%? And I bring your attention to places like the University of Michigan. I bring your attention to 2018 when it happened um, to other colleges where they had a spike that actually went up to 73% uh, during uh, three weeks of them testing. And all of these instances. Uh, all of them have a protocol. All of these institutions, they have a policy in place that says, if the flu gets to this level, we are going to shut down, okay? And they have, they've been doing this since 1993, where they shut down college campuses when there's an infection that will not lead to death. It will lead to a quality of life issue. They will get sick, but it typically does not lead to death. These colleges shut down, they assess the data, they make a determination and they shut down. Why is it that people like yourself had no issue with those colleges when they looked at data for their students and it was a flu issue for that season and they shut down classes either temporarily or for an entire semester. Nobody had a problem except when it comes to, to COVID, why? Well. Because I think that's a few isolated incidences compared to a national trend that's much bigger picture than that. And also I would say this, maybe they shouldn't be doing that for the flu. I'm happy to also say that, but with COVID yeah. there's just legitimately no reason to be depriving these young people of their extracurriculars, well, of their social life, of their in-person academic resources. Mm -hmm. Because we have hurt young people with our policies during this pandemic. Do you think that it hurts young people more? When you have a policy that disregards the public health issue, this is not. They're all vaccinated. This now. is not. They're all vaccinated. Well, but think about this. Individuals who are vaccinated are still getting sick. They can still catch COVID. Mild not symptoms. only can, not I only can they still. Ago, vaccinated, very I, mild I symptoms. You. All right, brother, that, that's fine. But based on the data, and once again, science is when you observe the field of study. Based on the field of study, People not only are still getting sick from COVID-19, they are still having long-term respiratory issues. And they are still likely to infect those around them. With the Omicron variant, it is highly infectious, more infectious than any other variant. And I don't see an issue with an institution saying, we are going to do the responsible thing, observe the field of study before we put our students in danger when we can simply pause in person learning for a couple of weeks for review. What's the problem with that brother? The problem with that is you're looking at a one dimensional approach. You're only thinking about COVID. You're not thinking about mental health. You're not thinking about social health. You're not thinking about academic opportunities and learning gaps. We have to learn to live with COVID. It is okay. here and unfortunately it doesn't look like it's going away anytime soon. Brad, do you agree that it is you know, a mental issue, like mentally uh, traumatizing for someone to engage in an ecosystem, a work environment ecosystem where people can infect them with COVID. As a matter of fact, remember I, I cited the data to you, 32% of respondents in the research led by Society for Human Resource Management 32% of individuals surveyed said it is the COVID infection factor. That's not college why students. We are not, wait a minute, you think college students are immune to that sentiment? Yeah, I, well, not immune, but I think college okay. students have very minimal fear of COVID. They all want where to be, almost all want to be in person. Where you got your data from on that? Ask any college student. Okay, you're pulling it out your ass like you did the other data. <laughs> Brad, I appreciate you being on my show, always a pleasure. Thank you. All right, thanks, Doc.